Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Hinckley Forum. My name is Maddie Hare. The University of Utah Hinckley Institute of Politics is a nonpartisan institute at the University of Utah. The Hinckley Institute provides an array of transformative experience for students through internships, forums, and classes. Hinckley forums seem to seek to foster public discourse and civil debate on the most current and pressing issues, bringing in local, national, and international thought leaders. Today's forum is titled The Untold History of Utah's Buffalo Soldier Soldiers and is presented as part of the University of Utah's Veterans Day programming. We are excited to have Mr. Robert Birch with us today, founder of the founder and executive director of the Sema Hey Haditi. I just messed it up again. <laughs> Sema Haditi, uh, African American Heritage and Culture Foundation. Sema Haditi Foundation was founded by Mr. Birch in August of 2020. Its mission is to tell the story of African ancestored history, heritage, and culture by researching, preserving, and disseminating information throughout the community. For years, both Robert and Alice Birch experienced community ignorance surrounding the history of blacks in Utah. Alice spoke with Robert often about focusing on bringing light to the many stories they had discovered. These stories are integral to the, history, to the story of Utah uh, yet were not being shared with the broader community. The more events, lectures, and conferences they produced on family history, the clearer it became that they needed to do things differently. The research in one area inevitably leads to a need in the other. The more genealogy research they participated in, the clearer it became that it should and that it could and should be used to help further the story of all of Utah. We are thrilled to have them here today. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Birch. Thank you. Is this on? Can you guys hear me? Okay. Okay. Uh, well, thank you all for being here. This is a nice turnout, and I really appreciate it, and, and hope that uh, we can help uh, expand some of the story of uh, black military in Utah. Uh, so first of all, again, my name is Robert Birch. I am the executive director of Samuel Haditi African American Heritage and Culture Foundation. I'm also the Utah chapter president of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society, which I was doing before we created Sam and Hadithi and led us to start talking about black history in Utah. I'm also the national vice president of the Sons and Daughters of the United States Passage, which is a lineage society, if you're familiar with what those are. Uh, so that is a lineage society to help African Americans document their uh, uh, family and personhood back to uh, enslaved people, to help remember them and, and celebrate them. The, the National Institute of Health uh, calculates that it was about 10 million African American slaves during the course of the uh, 270 something years from 14, uh, 14, 1619 to the end of slavery in 1865. Uh, so we do a lot, a lot, a lot of work on connecting people to their ancestors and sharing the successes and contributions of African Americans uh, in Utah. And so I hope you guys uh, uh, are able to learn something. And I hope that the, the first part of this is not too boring <laughs> for you, because it's a lot of lecturing and talking. But you guys are in college, so you get a lot of it anyway. <laughs> You're OK with that. OK, so uh, again, this is about uncovering the forgotten heroes, uh, the Buffalo Soldiers of Utah. This is a significant and often overlooked chapter of American history, the Buffalo Soldiers in Utah. Uh, these brave Ameri African American soldiers played a vital role in the development of Utah in the Uinta Basin, the Salt Lake uh, Valley, and the defense of the nation. Their contribution are, for the most part, forgotten. Uh, the birth of the Buffalo Soldiers. To truly understand the importance of these soldiers in Utah, we must first look at their origins. The Buffalo Soldiers are the result of the Army Reorganization Act of 1866. This is immediately following the Civil War, which authorized the formations of six all-American regiments. For these regiments, the 9th and 10th Cavalry, 
and the 24th and the 25th Infantry played a pivotal role in the American West. The other two were soon after they was created were closed now. So we only end up with four. The National Archives gives an excellent description of when, where, and how the regiments of black soldiers were created. Uh, and this is from an excerpt, uh, uh, researching African Americans in the United States Army, 1866 to 1890. During the Civil War, approximately 186,000 African Americans served in the Union Army in the U.S. Colored Troops. 186,000, keeping in mind that this not, uh, does not include the black sailors who served on ships. Half of the uh, Navy during, from the Revolutionary War to the Civil War were African American. Uh, let's see. Black soldiers served in volunteer, cavalry, artillery, uh, and infantry units in the Civil War, but the opportunity to serve as regulars in the Army was not afforded African Americans until after the Civil War. In 1866, due in large part to the wartime service of the colored troops, Congress authorized the Army to raise six black regiments, four infantry and two cavalry. This change was part of a much larger Army reorganization and laid the foundation of the proud tradition of the Buffalo Soldiers. Also, as I mentioned to you later, during this reorganization period, uh, there was some significant national uh, activities in Utah uh, in this reorganization as they prepared for the Spanish-American War. Um, this article des uh, describes record held by the National Archive Records Administration. On uh, eight, July 28, 1866, Congress passed an act, reorganized the Army by adding four regiments to the already existing six of cavalry and expanding the number of infantry regiments from 19 to 45. The reorganization included the creation of six colored regiments designated in November as the 9th and 10th Cavalry and the 8th, eight, excuse me, the 38th, 49th, 39th, 40th, and 41st Infantry. The new colored regiments would be comp composed of black enlisted men and white officers. Three years later, Congress reorganized the Army again by reducing the number of infantry units from 45 to 25. And for the African-American regulars, that reorganization changed only the infantry units <clears throat> and not the 9th and 10th Cavalry. The 38th Infantry and 41st Infantry became the 24th Infantry, while the 39th and 40th were consolidated into the 25th Infantry. These two new infantry regiments completely replaced the former 24th and 25th. <clears throat> for the next two years, the 9th and 10th Cavalry and the 24th and 25th Infantry served in the West on the frontier. The 9th and 10th Cavalry spent much of their time in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Indian Territory protecting citizens, mail and supply routes, and battling hostile natives and outlaws which was surprising for me to learn. I did not know the Buffalo Soldiers captured a lot of train robbers uh, for the United States government. The 24th Infantry served in the Department of Texas, Indian Territory, and Department of Arizona, while the 25th Infantry served in the Department of Texas and Department of Dakota. Now, here's what I thought was a special note. If you notice, the primary narrative... Um, Archives does not mention Utah or the Utah Territory. It was during this period that two of the regiments gained the nickname Buffalo Soldiers. The nickname initially described troops of the 10th Cavalry, but the 9th soon adapted the name as well. Although Native Americans bestowed the name upon the troopers, there are differing accounts as to the reason. One account suggests the name was acquired during the 1871 campaign against the Comanches when Indians referred to the cavalrymen as Buffalo Soldiers because of their rugged, they, of their rugged and tireless marching. Other accounts state that the Native Americans bestowed the nickname on the black troopers because they believed their hair of the black cavalrymen resembled the hair of the buffalo. 
Another suggests that the name was given because of the buffalo hide coats worn by the soldiers in the cold weather. The troops took the nickname as a sign of respect from Native Americans who held great reverence for the buffalo, and eventually the 10th Cavalry adopted the buffalo as a part of its regimental crest. And here I will also note that there are also other origin stories of the buffalo soldiers, and some not as flattering as you can imagine as these uh, African American soldiers become successful, uh, more derogatory things of them begin to emerge from those who did not want them in the army in the first place. Okay, the neglected legacy of Buffalo soldiers, as I mentioned, our particular uh, uh, concern is the Buffalo soldier story in Utah. Uh, there's been kind of a, a, a lacking in uh, stories and books and narratives that even talk about the soldiers and that they were that they were here. Part of the the, the uh, problem I feel in my estimation, and this is just Robert Birch speaking, is lack of publications. The history of Buffalo soldiers in Utah have been largely absent from historical accounts and publications. These soldiers make significant contributions. With a few exceptions, their stories were forgotten. There are several factors that I personally contribute to the lack of publications and historical accounts chronicling the contribution of Buffalo soldiers in Utah. One, of course, uh, what we've always seen to talk about in history is racism and prejudice. One of the primary reasons for the lack of publications is the pervasive racism and discrimination that plagued the African American community during that era when the Buffalo soldiers served. These soldiers faced external and internal threats. They faced the challenge of the frontier and racial bias from, from some within the military ranks. Discrimination also extended to the society at large. That extended to their introduction to the community of what is now Fort Duchesne and Fort du Douglas in Salt Lake City. The challenge of discrimination influenced what stories and achievements were deemed worthy of recognition. Second is the dominant narrative. The history of Americans in the West have been dominated by narratives often focused on the exploits of white settlers, pioneers, and white military figures. The stories of Buffalo soldiers, despite their invaluable contributions to the Westwood expansion and defense of the nation, were often overlooked in favor of more mainstream accounts that, pro that promoted a particular vision of what American history should be. A central part of the white narrative may be uh, Eastern Americans' antipathy towards Latter-day Saints which possibly meant that many white Americans outside Utah were not interested in the stories of Utah. At the same time, Latter-day Saints moved to, to what, was a, what was then the Mexican territory to separate themselves from the United States, where they encountered a lot of prejudice. At the same time, the Latter-day Saint culture vilified black people. So you had a people trying to uh, escaped the United States for religious purposes. And so many of those people out in New Jersey, New York, was like, y'all be good, stay out there, stay away from us. And, uh, and then you also had the, the discrimination that was coming through uh, the church rhetoric. Uh, three, limited access to education. Historically, African-American communities, particularly during this post-Civil War period, faced significant obstacles in documenting their experience. Many Buffalo soldiers may not have had the means or opportunity to record their stories, leading to a scarce, scarcity of primary sources. As a result, their experience of passed down orally, making it easier to lose their stories from popular memory. The limited access for African Americans to quality education created a cascading effect on their ability to produce written accounts of their experiences inevitably leading to fewer first-hand accounts. Without the means to record and publish their stories, their history remained oral, eventually being lost. Neglect by historians. Historians and scholars of the time I have seen less inclined to research and document the history of Buffalo soldiers 
due to the prevailing racial bias. And there is one actual documented, um, and, I, and I think I actually introduced that story here, where the white officers of the United States military said we need to get together and correct some of the discourses about black men, which have been negative. And so they got together and said, let's interview each other, document this, and tell the story that counters what uh, popular narrative is, has been about black soldiers because they felt that the black soldiers were not being served properly. Um, the absence of written records and prevalence of stereotypes about African Americans may have contributed to their omission from historical accounts. One big thing, geographic isolation. The remote and isolated location of some of the Buffalo Soldiers postings out west such as Fort Duchesne, Utah, challenging to sh made it challenging to share stories. Their deeds went unnoticed by those or the most more populous areas. Most of these soldiers never served around big cities. They were sent out west to Indian Territory and places like that. Uh, so that made it hard to even find their stories and know where they were. A combination of institutional racism, limited access to educational opportunities, and a lack of documentation has led to the underrepresentation of Buffalo soldiers in Utah's history. Overcoming these challenges and acknowledging the significant contribution of these brave individuals is a crucial step in rectifying this historical oversight and giving them the recognition they rightfully deserve. It is the mission of Samuel Hadithi to rectify this omission and share the stories with these, uh, of these unsung heroes. And so what our mission is, is really based on rediscovering history. Uh, believe it or not, a lot of these things are documented in records. And we have actually discovered as we've done our work that there are a lot of people who privately hold documents and records and newspaper ads and things on the soldiers out here. And so the, the big struggle has been not that the, the records don't exist, it's just that they're not being shared. And by the way, that is the, that is the reason we named ourselves Sema Haditi. Sema Haditi is Swahili for tell the story. As we help people with their genealogy and then coming against this, the narrative that there is no black history in Utah, then we begin to recognize we need to get these families to talk about their descendants because they've been here. Okay? The stories are just not being shared. So we, want, we really emphasize on telling the story. The Buffalo Soldier Station in Utah had some very significant and powerful effects in the life of Utah and stories of significance nationally. At Fort Duchesne, this following information comes from the African American Heritage Sites. It is a mobile site uh, to, to have people find heritage trails on African Americans. And it reads, Major Frank Frederick, excuse me, Major Frederick Benting, commander of black troops B and E of the 9th Cavalry, arrived at the pre-selected fort site in eastern Utah Territory, near the confluence of the Duchesne and Uinta Rivers. It was August 23, 1886. Benting and his troops had traveled a total of 650 miles, part of the distance by train, the rest on horseback from Fort McKinney, Wyoming Territory to help build and garrison a new army post to be called Fort Duchesne. The United States Army post of Fort Duchesne was established August 1886 on the Uinta and Ori Reservation. Construction of the fort began in 1887, close to where the established Indian agency had been. The fort was officially closed in 1912. The Uinta Band of Utes were removed to the area in 1865. Later in 1881, the White River and the um, Uncompraga Utes were removed from the Colorado and forced into the Uinta Reservation. A year later, the RA Reservation was established. The Uinta and RA Reservation is the second largest Indian reservation in the United States. The Buffalo Soldiers of the United States 9th Cavalry were a strong presence at Fort Duchesne. There were Buffalo Soldiers at the fort for 17 years, from 1886 to 1903, when the cavalry was sent to the Philippines 
in the Spanish-American War, and the Buffalo Soldiers were heroes at the Battle of San Juan Hill. In 1900, the men of the 9th Cavalry were called to Cuba, but the people in the area petitioned the government to keep them at Fort Duchesne, fearing that their absence from the fort would be disastrous for the area and the community. From 1890 to 1894, the Buffalo Soldiers of the 9th Cavalry were the only soldiers at Fort Duchesne. While at Fort Duchesne, Buffalo Soldiers played baseball, completed a target shooting contest, had boxing tournaments, went to community fairs, and participated in other various activities during their time in the area. Today, there is no remnant of Fort Duchesne in the area. All the buildings have been torn down because the fort was built on uh, tribal land, the direct area of the history of Fort Duchesne remains on tribal land. The town of Fort Duchesne is on the Uinta and Uri Reservation and it's the headquarters of the Ute Nation. Uh, the second place, Fort Douglas, and that's right here if you guys haven't been, uh, the, the Fort Douglas um, Military Museum is on this campus so you might want to go visit there. Uh, another important station was Fort Douglas in Salt Lake City where the soldiers provided stability and security during a tumultuous time in the region's history. Excerpts from the Black Soldiers at Fort du Douglas was written in 1896 by Michael J. Clark in the Utah Historical Quarterly for, in summer of 1978. According to newspaper reports, the new residents of Fort Douglas were pleased with their assignment and gratified at having been transferred from Texas to the Promised Land. Members of the unit apparently wanted the people of Salt Lake City to have a good impression of them for, as one member of the regiment stated, I do not say this from conceit, but you will find our regiment better behaved and disciplined than most of the white soldiers. And it's not an easy matter to get 600 men together without there being one or two unruly fellows among them. The arrival at the 24th was not without its impact upon the city's black community. When the soldiers arrived on the Union Pacific, it was reported that almost every colored resident in the city met them at the station. There would be greater contact between the fort and the black citizens of the city on the months to come. The black reg regiment was newsworthy. There was considerable talk about its band that over a three-year period would entertain thousands of Utah citizens. It's crack drilling and the ability of many of its members in athletics, both track and baseball. And, and just as a side note, there were quite a few black people in the military here who created almost 10 Negro baseball teams in Utah. And from those baseball teams came football teams. And from those football teams came boxers. So the African Americans in the military really created a culture of sport in Utah that ranged from baseball, football, boxing, and in some instance, even rodeo. So they had a huge influence on the sports culture of Utah. Julius Taylor, and I believe he was the editor of the Broad Axe. Okay. There was two black newspapers in Utah, and sometimes I get Julius Taylor confused. Uh, he, uh, energetic Gadfly was quick to report on his meetings with members of the regiment. Quote, after we had mingled with a great many members of the 24th Regiment, we came to the conclusion that they would rather crawl in bed with thousands of rattlesnakes rather than to associate with the following well-known Negro haters and high priests of the G.O. Lilly White Party, meaning C.C. Goodwin Esquire, editor of that well-known Negro hating sheet, the Salt Lake Tribune, P.G. Lannon, ex-butcher and manager of the same, ex-mayor George M. Scott, ex-banker James H. Bacon, the honorary James Glenning, Glenn, Dilling, Glenn Denning, and the honorable Frank J. Cannon, Cannon, as reported in the Salt Lake Tribune, October 16, 1896. Camp Kearns. During World War II, Buffalo soldiers trained at Camp Kearns. Technically, the term Buffalo soldiers referred only to the members of the 9th, 10th, 24th, and 25th 
However, until World War II, black soldiers were still being referred to as Buffalo Soldiers. Camp Kern was an important training facility for Army personnel headed overseas that, that was male as well as female. The camp train, uh, let's see, Camp Kern was also the location of one of the larger Negro baseball teams in Utah. The field in Kearns that they played on was recently torn down and converted into a sparse little park. And we, had, we was quite disappointed to go over there and find that everything was torn down and they mowed it over, threw some grass, put a fence around it, and basically that's all it is. It's just a little open field. Dr. Ronald Coleman, retired and noted educator of the history, history department of the University of Utah, made a notable contribution to the story of Buffalo Soldiers in Utah in a seminal edition used as reference material for the National Park Service. Okay. See that I mentioned you run and they turned the lights off on me. <laughs> but this is, this, is, this, this is Mr. Ron Coleman. He used to be a, a history professor here at the university. <laughs> and... Uh, he hates it when I tease him about being, you know, uh, Utah Carter G. Wilson, but he, he, has, <laughs> he has contributed quite a bit to us remembering the history of African Americans in Utah. This article, The Buffalo Soldiers, Guardians of the Uinta Frontier, uh, covered from the years of 1886 to 1901. There have been several studies on the history of black soldiers in the Civil War years. More than one historian has noted their presence at Fort Douglas, Utah, but none has examined the soldiers' on-duty as well as off-duty activities during their years in the Uinta frontier. The population of this region of eastern Utah was heterogeneous. Native Americans and whites were in substantial numbers. Various companies of soldiers, white and black, were stationed at Fort Duchesne in, in the last decade and a half of the 19th century. White troops were from the 21st, 16th Infantry, and the 17th and 15th Cavalry, while the blacks were from all from the 9th Cavalry, except for a six-month period in 1898 when the troops were fighting in the Spanish-American War. The post from September 19, 1892 until 1901 was garrisoned entirely by the 9th Cavalry of Buffalo Soldiers. Black soldiers at Fort Duchesne gave you one to count in the second largest black population in Utah in 1890 until early 1901. Thus, the station of black troops in the region provides an example of interracial adjustments on the western frontier. With the exception of racial antipathy from Indians and whites, the experience of black soldiers there and in other western stations were similar to those of white soldiers. Black troops were used to subdue, were used to subdue Native, Native Americans. They assisted in quelling disputes among whites, protecting stage and railway lines, building and maintaining military posts, opening and clearing roads, and seeing to the general well-being of frontier settlers. All military units practiced their skills in horsemanship, marching, marksmanship, Drill exercises, inspections, and annual marches kept the men in a state of preparedness. Black troops, like their white counterparts, performed the ceremonial duties, such as participating in parades and serving as honor guards at memorial observations. And again, this is really the one thing that I've ever seen that's been really nationally used to describe uh, Buffalo Soldiers in Utah is the National Park Service using this narrative that was uh, written by Ron Coleman. If you make the trip over to Fort Douglas Military Museum, where on the campus of the University of Utah, you can view the regimental flag that was placed atop San Juan Hill, Cuba, when the Americans took the hill. It is the ensign of the 24th Infantry of Fort Douglas, Utah the Buffalo Soldiers of Fort Douglas, Utah. There has been some controversy surrounding the popular story of who took San Juan Hill. Popular lore would tell you Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders. To combat the myth, 
of San Juan Hill, a group of white army officers got together to tell the story of black soldiers' service in Cuba. This is ultimately published in History of Negro Soldiers in the Spanish-American War and other items of interest, which was penned by Edward Austin Johnson in 1899. Uh, the work was not dis distributed widely. It is now in the public domain, and you can read it as an ebook on uh, Project Gutenberg. Unfortunately, a lot of the treatment was done by wa wa white officers that don't seem to have an interest in telling the Utah portion of the story. We, however, do recognize that the soldiers of the 24th in Utah, in Texas, were the soldiers who placed the flag on the hill because the unit number on the banner and the fact that it was returned to Utah by the soldiers who placed it there. So now uh, we've created some new efforts in trying to expand the, the story of Buffalo soldiers in Utah. Uh, we've done those things like by active portrayal, and I think we actually did that here, right, Allison? Right, at the University of Utah here. We, ha we had a representation of uh, Charles, no, no, Alan's Allensworth and his family. And so we're using uh, uh, active portrayals to, to help tell the stories of some of those soldiers like Alan Allensworth, uh, Brigadier General Charles Young. Uh, we also have created a, a large database. Uh, the database is a project that is privately sponsored by a member of the African American community. It is a comprehensive database compiling historical documents, photographs, and personal accounts related to Buffalo soldiers in Utah. This resource would be invaluable because of the history, researchers and history enthusiasts. Because of his support, we have compiled over 500 pieces of data to help us tell a fuller story of the Utah soldiers. Uh, at a different uh, act of portrayal, uh, we had a member of the black community who came out and saw that, and he was in, inspired to say, how can I help? And what he actually did was went out and employed a person to do the research for us and document it for us. And so we were able to now have those 550 data points about Buffalo soldiers in Utah. The Allensworth family is important to the Buffalo soldiers' history in Utah. And this is the Allensworth family right here. Pastor and Lieutenant Colonel Allen Allensworth. Allensworth it was a Baptist preacher. Uh, his wife, Josephine, was an educator and musician. She played the piano. And his two daughters, Eva and Nella, Eva played the piano, and Nella played the violin. And so between that family, they could do a whole sunny service by themselves. <laughs> and, and, and they would do that. And they would also do special evening events on the weekends for the soldiers. The soldiers would sit out in the grass on the uh, parade grounds, and the Allensworth would speak and, and play music for them. Uh, let's see. They also uh, created uh, schools and classes for the soldiers to help educate the soldiers. Um, so Cap Chaplain Allen's work with the spiritual and educational father for the men. Uh, he also served as a calming voice for the larger Salt Lake City community concerned about black soldiers serving in the city. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, coming to Salt Lake City, they were not real happy to, to know that there's going to be some 600 some odd black men with rifles up on top of the hill. And uh, Mr. Allen's work spent a lot of time at the, at the community speaking and helping to resolve their concerns and fears about the men. Uh, his wife and daughters helped him uh, bring meaning and spiritual service through music and other educational opportunities. We're also creating an exhibit panel, part of which what you see here. We can continue to develop a series of exhibit panels highlighting Buffalo soldiers displayed in museums, library, and educational institutions. There is the veterans exhibit that's over in the, in the building next door here, if you guys haven't seen it. Uh, it's not just a Buffalo soldier exhibit. 
it's a black veterans of Utah exhibit. So uh, as we find these stories of Buffalo soldiers here, we add it to the exhibit. And as contemporaries learn about the exhibit, we allow them to submit their profile. So they're added to the exhibit as well. And we do display those here, like at the University of Utah Libraries, Museums, and uh, other places. Let's see, Utah State Historical Preservation Office, under the leadership of Chris Merritt, is partnering with Samuel Hadithi to create a Buffalo Soldier Heritage Trail, which will be comprised of seven significant lo locations throughout Utah. Each location will have a, as a comprehensive narrative uh, of information available. So a part of that trail would be Fort Douglas, which is home of the 24th Infantry uh, and the Heroes of San Juan Hill, Strawberry ba Valley. And if you're not familiar with the Strawberry Valley, uh, it is the location of the so-called Tin War, marking the first time the United States Army combined the elements of cavalry, infantry, and artillery in live practice rounds. Believe it or not, they never put all three of those units together before. So this is the first time you had men on horseback, men on foot, and men firing artilleries practicing together at the same time. That happened here in Strawberry Valley in the United States. Okay? Uh, this involved cavalry units of the 9th out of Fort Duchesne. This practice was instrumental in the preparation of all American forces to effectively execute the Spanish-American War. Um, Fort Duchesne, which, we, which I've also mentioned, that would be uh, the third location. Then a part of the Heritage Trail would be you went to County His Heritage Museum. The museum and history library houses a significant amount of Buffalo soldiers, news, and reports and articles. The, the next one would be the combination of the Gate Canyon and Nine Mile Canyon. Uh, these are the location of roads built by the soldiers and other significant markings left by them. They were tasked with pat patrolling freight and military roads from the Uinta Basin to the railway in Price. The last one would be Price Helper, where the soldier helped to keep the peace and protect train depots from robbery and to protect uh, infrastructure of price and helper. So there's a large area of Utah where the soldiers served. In the, 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 the State Preservation Office is working with us to collect those stories and actually set up markers uh, at different stops in Utah to learn about what the Buffalo soldiers did in that particular area. Yes. Has anybody done a study of what the court martial records were for the blacks versus the whites at Fort Douglas? Uh, no, not that I know of. Doesn't mean that it hadn't been. That's just not something that I, I know about. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, many of those records, I don't think the Army has even kept over the years, perhaps. But that's not a question that we've ever actually looked into. Um, we, we do know that there was some issues and relationships there. Uh, and, and Ashley, one of the, there's an interesting story I can tell you about one of the, the men over there. Okay. Uh, in conclusion, the Buffalo soldiers were not just soldiers. They were pioneers, defenders, and heroes who deserve their rightful place in history. We hope that our ongoing work, including active trails, a comprehensive database, exhibit panels, and the Allensworth family story will help to ensure that the legacy of the Buffalo soldiers in Utah is no longer ignored or forgotten. Together, we can celebrate their achievements and contributions to our great state and to our nation. So I hope that just gives a little bit of interest of stories that you guys might find interesting about Buffalo soldiers in Utah. Uh, and uh, I can share some of the stories of some of these panels as well, if you like. If I, anyone have any questions, I'd be glad to answer. them. If you have a question, I'll pass you the microphone. We're going to start with one from online really quick. Okay. Um, they ask, and they said they 
All right, I'll just read it. Mr. Birch, are you aware of any retired soldiers of the 24th Inf Infantry who, as freedmen living into the turn of the century, became part of the Freedmen's Bureau who had their stories documented? Uh, no, I don't know. Uh, we haven't worked on the Freedmen's Bureau at all. Uh, but many of the soldiers, Buffalo soldiers, actually stayed here. Uh, and one of the reasons we know that they stayed here is that the 24th was being mustered out of Louisville, Kentucky, and out of Louisiana. When we look at other people who moved to or stayed in Utah, many of them were from Kentucky. So we know that the Buffalo Soldiers had a huge influence on uh, the black people who moved here because the people from Louisville and around Louisville started moving uh, to Utah, to Salt Lake in particular. Uh, one of those Buffalo Soldiers, uh, this gentleman, he's actually from Natchez, Mississippi, and this is a Buffalo Soldier that served at Fort Duchesne. Uh, excuse me, not Fort Duchesne, Fort Douglas. Okay. And these are his three sons who served in the Spanish-American War. So, uh, and Mr. Merriman, uh, uh, Merriman Howard Ellis, actually uh, stayed here in Utah. And I believe all of his sons passed here in Utah. So this is a, a, a family of soldiers from Utah. Uh, we also have a lot of other whole families that were documented uh, as Utah soldiers. For instance, the Ellis Scott family had seven soldiers who served in the United States military who lived and died here in Utah. And so we have several stories like that. Yes, sir. Uh, do uh, did the, sold, the Buffalo soldiers uh, meet or intermingle? I'm going to have you ask them that question again. Ask that question again. Did the Buffalo soldiers interact with the blacks who had come with the pioneers in 1847 and settled in Mill Creek, and some of them were the first police officers yes. at Salt Lake City. Um, I don't know the, about the number of police officers, um, but they spent a lot of time downtown uh, in the historic uh, Franklin Road area. Uh, I get it backwards where it was first called Franklin and called Edison, or first called Edison and now it's Franklin. But if you go downtown uh, Salt Lake City and go down to Franklin, Edison, which one, you can actually see that historic district. And uh, a couple of businesses has actually taken on the name of black individuals in that particular district, like H.H. Uh, H. Voss, who was considered the mayor of um, that area because he was all black. Uh, and also uh, the hotel there. I can't remember I remember what they called it. I think they call it the Franklin Avenue Hotel now. So there are some still some historical buildings down there where the Buffalo Soldiers uh, used to hang out. But they had a lot of activities in the black community. And of course, you can tell soldiers not to go downtown and drink and have fun, but you, myself being a former military man, I know we sometimes break the rules. <laughs> go where we're not supposed to go. <laughs> he was there. Yeah, I'm interested in the uh, situation with the Buffalo Soldiers and the Native American population. Yes. I mean, they were obviously commandeered to subdue the Native Americans, and that must have been an amazing, uh, amazingly complicated situation, I think. It was, uh, and it's something that, you know, I've talked to African Americans about, and uh, we get a lot of criticism about trying to uh, recover the story of Buffalo Soldiers because there are a lot of black people who would say, we were oppressed by white folks, now why would black soldiers go out back and oppress the natives? So that we have that narrative to deal with. And the other part is that we don't get a lot of those stories uh, on the Native American side because it's up to them to see. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, uh, it's sometimes difficult to get Native Americans to share their story, and it's obvious why. You know, um, 
but having tried to build a relationship, there is it's very hard to get a lot of those stories, and you know, uh, and but that is something we have talked about. Just hours on end, how to recover some of those stories, but it's entirely up to the Native Americans to share them. Yes, ma'am. So I have two questions. I didn't quite catch the 10,000 rattlesnakes in the Salt Lake Tribune. <laughs> if you could just summarize that again. But then, and then another question is, um, you mentioned that, let's see, that, that the Buffalo soldiers were not officers, except I see right. that. It, right, they're officers. Right. Did the infra white infantry men and the black infantry men receive the same pay, or were the white ones paid more than the blacks? Um, that's a complicated story going all the way back to the American Revolution. There's always been a disparity in pay. Uh, so uh, we haven't gotten any records of complaints, particularly on soldiers in Utah. But being a part of uh, Afro-American Heritage and, uh, excuse me, the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society on a national basis, I know that there has there has been. Uh, but same, rank. same rank, you know. I mean, understanding that these men are coming out of uh, 1867, 1865, at the end of the Civil War, where in the South they were still considered five fifths of a human were even just on that number alone dictated that you didn't pay them the same. And so these soldiers were still dealing with that. These, these guys was coming out of Kentucky, uneducated, Louisiana, Texas, Mississippi. You had northern officers who may have just fought for them in the Civil War, but didn't necessarily consider them their equal. So yeah, that, that, that's always been an issue uh, across time. Okay. And they, uh, Oh, he was making he he was making reference about uh, sleeping with ten thousand real estate and, and rather than serving with white men. Is really what that black soldier was saying. Uh, let me see if I can find the exact phrasing for you. Hmm. Here we go. And this is being reported by Julius Taylor, okay? After we had mingled with a great many members of the 24th Regiment, we came to the conclusion that they would rather crawl in bed with 10,000 rattlesnakes, oh, rattle, rather than associate with the following well-known Negro haters and high priest. So they was making a reference not just to the Salt Lake Tribune and others when they're saying high priest, they're referring to the LDS church. So they would rather you know, deal with 10,000 rattlesnakes than to deal with these white men. All right, we got time for one more question. And then another thing I will say is on the way out, we ask that you guys take some time to look at these awesome exhibits. Excuse me, one uh, quick question about the cemeteries. Uh, mm -hmm. You could mention, I think, if I'm correct, there's one right across yeah. from Rice Eccles uh, Stadium. Uh, the, and where well, would it be that, yeah. in Duchesne? Because I'm quite sure the same thing. And uh, the other quick question was, mm -hmm. is there lingering antipathy between Native Americans and the black Americans? Uh, there's lingering antipathy from the Native Americans with everybody. So I could go out as an African-American and talk to them and get treated the same way that white Americans would get treated. So the Native Americans are very touchy about their traditions and our understanding of how those traditions should be uh, observed. I can't remember, but I think Mr. Mr. Ellis there was buried at Mount Olivet. There is a cemetery here Fort Douglas Cemetery here on campus as well, um, with a lot of soldiers from the 9th and the 24th and other places. So if that soldier had died in Fort Duchesne, 
they would have either sent his body home or brought him here uh, uh, to the cemetery here at, at Fort Douglas. Uh, and uh, I guess a couple of little quick things. I would, and, I, and I want to tell this story because I think it's important because it's relevant today. This is Mr. Jackson and Mr. Carter. At the time, Mr. Jackson was the highest ranked African-American enlisted man in the United States Army stationed at Fort Douglas. This young man was a decorated soldier coming out of San Juan Hill. And he had PTSD. One of the notable things here too is that he was decorated for arresting robbers and things of that nature. So a very good soldier. And this is something that really wasn't talked about a lot at the time. But you notice both of these men died on the same day. This young man with the PTSD killed his ranking sergeant. Unfortunately, the rest of the troops had to kill Carter. But this is an issue that we keep dealing with, and historically we don't even talk about a lot of the times, was PTSD. This young man came back from San Juan Hill a totally different person. And so I just wanted to point that out because that is very important that we keep this in mind as we look at these men that we call heroes and sometimes neglect the misunderstanding that they get when they come home. Okay. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Let's give them a round of applause. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you.